think you're doing better than I am. Definitely. A hundred percent. And you know what? That switched. I think a few weeks ago, that wasn't the case. I am so, overwhelmed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to talk if, about it? it well, we've just, you know, for m- most people know we live in Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania has winter and <laughs> beautiful <laughs> think about Pennsylvania in the winter is it snows right. and when it snows there's 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 no school right I don't yeah know how people do it um so you know we're doing it it's okay things are going well right uh-huh uh-huh, uh-huh. hanging in there we're <laughs> and listen it speaks to the fact that you know a few weeks ago I was the one struggling now you're feeling overwhelmed and that we can switch off and mm-hmm. support each other. So, yeah. So the thing is there's snow and then the school gets changed and then there's all this stuff. And like, I don't do super well with a lot of shifts in schedule. I, I, I'm a routine girly. That you are. <laughs> that you are. And I have a routine, right? I wake up at six. I get everyone ready. I drive Millie to school. I go to the gym. I go by shower, right? Like I have a whole thing. It's not. It's not been great. <laughs> no, no. What happens when you're, what do you do when your routine gets thrown off? So I try super hard to be chill and I'm not. So, <laughs> so like usually I try to take myself down. At some point I will always have a breakdown and then I usually come out of that breakdown. I feel a little better. And I had that this morning mm. and then I feel a little better coming out of it. There it is. Maybe you need the breakdown. I think I need the breakdown. Just don't be chill. Just have the breakdown immediately. I think you try so hard to be like, all right, that's fine. I can adjust. Everything's good. And um, it's hard. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, but either way, we're here today. It's sunny, (laughs) beautiful, blue sky day. And we have an amazing question from listener Sam. Listener Sam. is also a prospective MFT student. We love it. We love to hear it. it. She, they asked, what was your favorite class in college or grad school? Hmm. Grad school was probably our couples therapy class. With Steve Treat. Yeah. Thanks to Steve Treat. It was amazing. He was mm-hmm. so good. And it was just, you just are learning so much. Like I can't even stress the amount that you, that we learned. I should speak for our experience. We learned in grad school that just simply blew my mind and it just changes your perspective in so many ways. So I think the couple, the couples therapy class really did that for me. It was, it was our intro. Um, but it just, you go from one perspective of relationships to like just a completely different perspective of relationships. And it's just, it really is mind blowing and it, it seeps into all of your relationships too, the more you integrate it. So yeah, I would have to say couples therapy. And then undergrad, I had this class about memory and cognition. Oh. And you know, what's interesting is that he, the teacher wouldn't, um, he would just talk the whole time and you had to take notes. And so basically the learning in the class was also testing your own memory and cognition. And it was, he, he talked so quickly and so fast. It was it was like one of the most challenging classes I took, but also the most interesting. And I, you always had to go to class because if you missed a class, then, you know, you didn't get any notes. Um, so, yeah, I would say those are my two. What about you? Wow, that's really interesting. I wish I had that. Yeah, so cool. I had this class. I think I, I talked about it on here because of the whole snake thing, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I had um, psychopathology in undergrad was really awesome. I wish I remember that professor's name. He was so great. In grad school, probably couples therapy with Steve yeah. Treat, but I also really loved all of our sex therapy work. I really yeah. found that interesting um, because also I found the SARS interesting. And if, Me you too. Don't know, if you don't know what a SAR is, a SAR is a sexual um, attitude reassessment. Um, and what that means is you sit in a classroom and you essentially watch porn, educational porn. What would you call it? Just porn. <laughs> Just Different porn. Porn. And then you talk Different about, types. You talk about what is coming up for you. Um, what it's bringing up for you. And then you have a class discussion about it. I found that very interesting. And so, yeah, we had to do that twice in grad school and it's a very interesting thing. And it's, if you become a sex therapist, it's something you have to do in the process. And it's very interesting because sometimes you'd be pretty surprised about what is activating for one person versus another. And so I thought that was all fascinating. And when do you ever get get to have an educational conversation about porn, you know? (laughs) 
I don't only it's such a grad school, such an academic grad school. Such an thing. academic, right? <laughs> really but takes also, the really takes the uh, fun out of porn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's funny. Cause at first you're like, Oh, am I going to feel really aroused in the classroom? Like, I don't know about you, but I had that fear. That was not yeah. fear of yours going in. No, no. It, it was a fear of mine, but I didn't end up. No, 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 no. You at do at all. No, no, you do not. <laughs> yes. But going not even in, a you're like, Oh my God, am I going to be like all horny by the end of this eight hours? And no, by the end, you're just eating pizza and talking about it. So no. Yeah. Um, but I will say both those, but we said before, like we would totally be in school for the rest of our lives. If, if it was free, it's not even a question. Like I lifetime learners for everyone. Would do, always. but but specifically grad school. Like I would want to be learning the things that I actually care oh, about. Like because, I don't want to go back to gen eds and right and undergrad. Yeah, like I don't want to go back to Eng English class. Like not interested. <laughs> um, but you know, it doesn't take us into our topic for today. But it will still get us there. Um, today we wanted to talk about family dynamics specifically how they shift and change in adulthood. Uh, we've talked a lot about family dynamics on our podcast, but there's something really specific that happens when you become an adult where your dynamics almost like unexpectedly change, like your relationships with people in your family unexpectedly change. Um, and as we were talking about at the beginning of this, change can be really jarring. It can be really difficult. Um, and so we got a ton of questions about family dynamics and how they shift as you're entering into adulthood. So we're going to jump right into them. You know, I thought it was interesting that so many people had replied back mainly about the complexity of this. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that's fascinating that everyone thinks this is so difficult. And I think sometimes, you know, I, I loved, wait, we got one question that I want to start with. As a kid, I was always the butt of the jokes. How do I tell them I finally had enough? And I think one of the reasons it feels so complex is sometimes it feels like we're still not being seen as a grown up. But also, what that tells me is that in a lot of families, children are spoken down to and treated poorly. Mm -hmm. And the hard part about that is that, like, I think we live in a culture that sees kids as, um, stupid or silly mm. and they're not <laughs> no and they're not and I think you know I'm I'm thinking specifically about this question someone feeling like they're the butt of the jokes and when you're always in this dynamic like let's say you've been in this dynamic for 30 years right where you've been the butt of the jokes and 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 the whole family is kind of invested in this dynamic um that for you to stand up and say hey I'm not going to take this anymore. Um, it's a really brave thing to do to work to change those dynamics. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is a very brave thing to do. And I think some of the reason why we keep ourselves from doing that in adulthood is that we wonder, well, how is everyone else going to react to that when I do something different? But we have to bear the discomfort of the possibility of other people's reaction in order to make a change to the dynamic that the only way we're going to be able to make that change is if we sit in that discomfort of I need to say something and people are going to say what they're going to say about it but I can still sit with this because I no longer want to be the butt of the joke I want to make a change and so what is it that I have control over in this dynamic in order to make that change what do you think, why do you think it's so hard for parents to see their children as grownups? I think it speaks to how parents were also treated mm -hmm. um, when they were children. I think that we bring in our kind of internal internalized child um, and how we were treated as a child. And we bring that into our parenting. And I think generations ago, it was really normalized that children were seen and not heard, that, um, you know, they were talked down to. And, and so I think generationally, it's been changing, but it takes time to make that change because we take our models 
of what parenting looks like from how our parents parented us. And we bring that into our relationship with our children um, if we're not aware of it. And so the key there is to make that a little bit more conscious to say, do I want to repeat the same patterns um, from my childhood? Do I want to do the same thing that my parents did? Without that level of consciousness, we just repeat it. It just happens. We just function in the same way. Um, and so making that very conscious of, is this something that I want to continue to do? Or is this something that I want to change? Um, I was, I was, you're going to be shocked to hear this, right? Yeah, yeah. But I saw a video online and where do you think I saw the video? Uh, uh, Reddit. <laughs> is it, am I right? <laughs> saw this video on Reddit, which I'm going to find and have Nikki post, but it was a freaking TV commercial PSA from like the late seventies about being nicer to your kids. So that literally tells you that we had to teach parents to treat children with kindness. But we've come a long way. <laughs> now we're in gentle parenting. <laughs> but they had to put it on TVs. <laughs> well, so I, they had to be um... like, oh, wait, guys, we were <laughs> wrong before. Don't be assholes to your children. I even remember this when I was a child. Like one of the things that I was really looking for for my parents was to not treat me like a child. Like I always felt like I was being treated like a child. I was also the youngest in my family. Um, but that was like a really big thing for me. And breaking out of that was also a really important thing for me to go into. I don't want to be treated like the youngest. Like, yes, I'm the youngest of all of you, but I'm no longer a child. Um, and, but even I, you know, I was really young when I was feeling this way. I did not want to be treated like a child. And so I think that we can look at the ways in which we struggled growing up and say, you know, the person who says, I don't want to be the butt of the joke, the person who, you know, falls in a very specific dynamic and say, well, how do I want to break out of that? What do I, what do I want to change? What do I want to do differently? Hmm. So how to address and acknowledge the shift within a family that avoids confrontation. So let's say I come from a family that totally avoids confrontation, but now there's a shift and things are different. Mm. And so talking about things doesn't have to be confrontation, but when you come from a family that avoids confrontation, it's probably going to feel like it, right? And yes. so saying something that's honest doesn't have to be, and I think this goes back to our really great episode about passive aggressiveness. When you have a family that's like avoids confrontation, typically what will happen is we either are totally avoidant or we're passive aggressive or we end up blowing up and it's like, well, I sure as shit, I'm not coming to your house for fucking Christmas, right? Like we have some explosion and addressing, acknowledging the shift can be something saying like, wow, I guess the holidays are really different now that we're older. Mm. it's really challenging that we're all in different places now. Wow, this feels different. Is it like that for you too? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering why um, this person asks about confrontation specifically is why it feels like it has to be a confrontation, right? That I think maybe what you're saying is a family that avoids intimacy in certain ways um, avoids deeper communication, connection. And so understanding kind of the underpinnings of it, of what makes this challenging for us? Um, and do I want to be the one to start to create that shift in the family? And maybe that means that you're, you know, starting in very specific dyads in the family, right? Where you're building different types of relationships with each person where it doesn't just happen all at once. Um, and I think sometimes when we think about changing our family dynamics, we think, you know, we can think about it as a whole of like, I have to change my dynamic towards every single person. And that, that can feel really overwhelming. So if you more so think of it as you can make small changes in like the dyads in your relationships um, and watch how that trickles into the family dynamic. Um, but yeah, I don't necessarily feel like, oh, it has to be some sort of confrontation. Like you said, Em, it can just be talking about like, have, do you feel this? You know, does this feel different for you? 
Um, and so let's go with the feelings with it because there's another amazing question that um, I just like the way this person said this is, um, I still feel like I'm sitting at the kids' table even though we've hosted multiple holidays. So one, how much of that is internal? Mm. I feel like, right? So maybe I feel infantilized. Maybe people talk down to me or maybe I feel insecure. And so the hard part is to suss out what's the story we're telling ourselves around this. And maybe this person totally is being infantilized and being treated like that, yeah. or they feel like they're still not good enough or old enough. And I think that we, we have this idea about how we're supposed to feel at a certain age. I mean, Jen, we run this huge business and like most of the time, like, don't you feel like sometimes childlike? Yes. <laughs> You're like, am I like, did you guys believe me yet? I know what I'm doing. Like, why? Like, they, like, I think that I thought at this age with this business and what we do, I think I had expectations. I would feel differently. Totally. I think we look around at other people and we think that everyone has it all together. Yes. And I think a lot of the time we feel childlike. I think I, I was also thinking about this too. There's times in our business where I feel very confident and very adult. And then there are times in which I feel very childlike. I, and and typically, I don't know if you feel this way, the times in which I feel the most childlike is when there are changes and there's things that I don't fully understand yet. Mm -hmm. I feel the most adult when I've been doing something within the business for a long time and then I feel confident in it. So the conversation around insurance benefits has been very overwhelming. Exactly. So like I, you We're know, like, I, what's insurance, right? It's like, so, so something like that, you know, it's, it puts you into like a, I feel the most childlike when I don't understand something, Yeah. you know, when I, I haven't been doing something for that long. Right. And if you think about a child, children are learning new things all the time, right? They're like learning how to walk. They're learning how to talk. They're learning how to interact. And so it, it puts you really into this like childlike kind of state mm -hmm. to be doing something so new. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the place where we have to gain some perspective, not just us, but anyone going through this is that just because we feel childlike doesn't mean we're unable to do it, that it's just a signal that we have things to learn and we have ways to grow. Sometimes when you are thrown into that state, it's easy to take that and it become your whole narrative of, I never know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this. I'm not going to be able to figure it out. Yeah. I So making meaning, making a bigger meaning out of those experiences where you don't really know what you're doing and having that trickle into other areas of your life. That's where I think creating that boundary around that is important and gaining that perspective of, no, this is just something new. Mm -hmm. And when you own a business and just in life, you're always experiencing new things. You're always having to do something different. And so just because you feel childlike, it doesn't mean that you're unable to work through it. You're unable to learn it. Like you will get through it and you will be able to learn this and you will grow into an adult in that specific transition. You know what I'm thinking is that so often children are really good at having humility, right? So Millie's going to be five, five. Um, and I'm still not invited to her birthday. Yes. <laughs> You're not invited to her birthday party. <laughs> You're not. I don't think I can make it that day. <laughs> Have we told this story before? I don't know, but we should. The story is that I had put in, like, we have a shared calendar, right? I had put in Millie's birthday party date and Jen sends me this text is like, I don't think that I can come to Millie's birthday party. I'm not available. And I was like, yeah, you weren't invited to that. It's for, I was like, oh, I was it's like, for oh, children. Thank, I was like, oh, thank God I can't come. <laughs> so once again, it's for children. Right. Um, so but I, can't, this, I can't go that day either. Continue. Millie is big into working on her uh, using a pair of scissors, right? So she wants to know how to cut things and she's very interested and like, I don't really want her to be cut. <laughs> she came home from school a few weeks ago and she goes, I cut my hair in class and I didn't tell anyone. I kept it a secret. And I was like, what did you do with the hair? She was like, I put it in the trash can. Good. It could have been, I could have taken a turn. She could and have I eaten was like, it. <laughs> I was like, did anyone else cut their hair? She was like, no, but Ellie saw me and she laughed. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, okay, but just don't do that again. Maybe she's going like, to come home one day and 
all of her hair. Yes. It's going to be cut off. I was like, thank you for telling me. Um, if you want, we can go to the hairdresser and I bet they'll help you and let you cut a little bit off. Okay. So whatever. But either way, super into learning about um, skills of cutting. The interesting part that children are really good at is Millie will be like fucking up or look like she's going to cut herself. And I'll be like, oh, let me help you. And she's like, no, I got this. And she has this assertiveness. For me, what she's saying is back off, lady. And she's <laughs> right. If I, she doesn't learn this and I just do it for her, she doesn't learn the skill. And we need to have that same humility in adulthood. Mm. If someone tries to come in, let's say you're hosting Thanksgiving, you're trying to figure out the turkey and someone tries to take it over. You can say, you can guide me, but I want to do this myself. Yes. And it's that ability to one, be brave and stand up for yourself, but also to have humility. of I don't know what I'm doing and that's okay. I'm figuring it out and I will only figure it out by doing. It's such a relieving thing to be able to say out loud when you're doing something that you don't really understand or know to be able to say like I don't know what I'm doing I said this to my husband the other, the other day when we were talking about the business and I was like I was like I you know we made such a big switch I was like I don't really know what I'm doing but I'm gonna figure it out to just say that out loud was so relieving because you know holding it in and just, I think it goes back to the expectations of like having this expectation of yourself of like, I should know what I'm doing. I should be able to figure this out. And then you hold it in and you hold it tightly and you don't talk to anyone about it, but it makes you feel like garbage inside. And so to just say out loud, I don't know what I'm doing, but I am doing my best to figure it out. Just such a relieving statement and also gives you the space to be able to to just admit that to yourself, admit that to other people so that they know where you are. And if you need help, you can ask for it. Um, but I just think that's such an important piece to be able to hold on to. You don't have to have it all figured out and you're not going to. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing something. It's okay to not have it all figured out. It takes time. Somebody wrote in and said, my single dad didn't help me transition into adulthood. I often feel lost and overwhelmed. Mm. And I think that's true. Some people get really great guidance, right? So a few different things can happen as you emerge into adulthood. You have parents who do everything for you, and so you don't learn the skills. You have parents that don't know how to help you, so they're avoidant. You have parents that do a wonderful job of guiding you. And then for most of us, it's a spectrum in between all these things, right? And when we don't have the guidance, I think it can feel really overwhelming and scary. And I, you know, when this is a really large conversation is often with kids in puberty. Mm. Kids going through puberty, they're not taught about their bodies, don't have the appropriate language for their bodies, don't know how, and it feels embarrassing or shameful, right? And I've also had people talk about this a lot in terms of finances. I'm embarrassed that I have credit card debts. I'm embarrassed that I did this, but nobody taught me skills. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And I'm walking around a college campus. Somebody gives me an application for a credit card. I get it. I open it. I put money on it. Boom, this is where I am. The shame keeps us so quiet. Yeah. As opposed to saying, you know what? My parent didn't help me transition into the adulthood the way I would like. Here are the skills I think I'm missing. Where could I go for guidance? Mm. I wonder too how much this person is comparing themselves to other people. They're seeing friends or people, you know, their age who are getting more guidance and what that's bringing up for you. Um, because it's true, we don't choose, you know, who our parents are. Sometimes our parents don't have the ability to give us the guidance that that we need. And so we have we can look for that in other resources. Um, and finding those resources is really, really key. What else we got? Okay. Can I do the next one? I know I keep picking them, but I just think no, that I, these are very I good. I love when you pick them, please. <laughs> you know, we, we sometimes we get really nasty messages. So sometimes I can't tell. Like sometimes when I get quiet on the podcast and I'm just sitting there, it's because we've received these nasty messages about how annoying no. I typically am is really no. what we get. No. They said, Emily, stop, stop interrupting Jen. And I said, Em, you do not interrupt me. Also, also I, 
what people don't realize is we can see each other when we record. Yes. So you're usually telling me to fucking like. I'm done. Around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am done. <laughs> But then I'm like then hyper fixated on like how much I talk don't. versus you talk. You be I, it gets in my head. Be yourself. You don't change a thing about who you are just because one person said that you interrupt me. I disagree. I am going to tell you that I feel good about our back and forth. That is what matters. Okay. Don't get in your head. We can Please. see each other. Exactly. <laughs> Please tell me the next question. Pick all of the questions. I don't want to pick them. <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be brave. <laughs> um, I want to talk about this one because I think it's interesting and I think it speaks to a lot of people, which is I have zero contact with my brother. How to handle with aging parents. It feels inevitable the contact will happen again. It probably will. Yes. <laughs> I think that's a huge life transition mm -hmm. as your parents get older and what that shapes and shifts in your family dynamic. Um, but yeah, you will most likely have contact with a sibling again. And then when you get to that point, you'll have to decide like, what will this relationship look like? Mm -hmm. You know, is this relationship going to change? Is it going to be the same? Um, are we just going to talk about, you know, our parents getting older? If someone gets sick, is that the only kind of communication we're going to have? Um, what's the reason why we stopped talking? You know, what's the reason why we don't have contact? Do you know, have those reasons changed? Are we different people now? I think sometimes we hold on so strongly to who other people once were, who we once were, and it keeps us from growing and evolving in our relationships. And so, you know, this might be a very kind of silver lining thing to say, but it might give you an opportunity to revisit and say, Am I different? Is my sibling different? Do we want to create something different? If not, that's okay. Um, but it, there's opportunity there. Yeah. And I think on, then also this is when we talk about like there's different ways to communicate, right? So maybe it'll be that, you know what, me and my sibling just communicate over email just about this. Yes. Doesn't mean we have to be meeting up and be in person. Like you find the safest, most effective way to handle the situation. But yeah, as your parents get older, it changes a lot. And I think it's really important for you to be talking to your partner or your chosen family or your born family, siblings, whatever that looks like of how you're going to handle as someone gets older, because it's very complex. And especially, I mean, there's all this interesting data now about how, you know, in 20 years, how many people don't have the money saved they need towards retirement and how that will be falling on their children. Mm. And that, for I know so many people, is very overwhelming to think about is what am I going to do if my parents cannot afford to stay in their home, to be in the assisted living facility? What's this going to mean about what do I owe to them? Mm. Another thing I was thinking about is gray divorce. Yes. Which is a huge shift in a family dynamic. Which is your parents um, get divorced later on. Just for later on. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Sorry to interrupt. Just assuming. <laughs> just assuming everyone knows. Um, great divorce, I think, really, you know, changes the family dynamic in a way where your whole life, if you've seen your parents together, for better or for worse, you know, when your parents get divorced, maybe they start dating, you know, new people. There's a huge shift and change that you have to enter into. Whether it's watching your parents enter back into dating life, you know, a place where you've never seen them before, um, seeing parents struggle with loneliness, seeing them, you know, just, just think it, it shifts everything. So I just want to highlight the fact that like when one thing or one dynamic or one relationship changes within a family system, the entire family system shifts. It affects everything. So final question then on that note, how to grow out of old dynamics when you're the only one changing or seeing it? Mm. This is where I go back to working with each dyad, mm. you know, working with each relationship that you have within the family dynamic. Um, 
there's only so much you can do when someone is unwilling to look at some of the patterns that are happening in the family. And so I think you come to a point where you say, do I want to keep, you know, banging my head against a brick wall, trying to show people what the dynamic is? Or do I want to accept the fact that this is the dynamic? I only have so much control over what's happening. And do I want to grieve the idea that there will be a change here? And what is it that I can do in order to take care of myself if there isn't a change? What will this look like for me? Are you ready for Dear Emma and Jim? Always. Dear Emma and Jim, my husband and I have been together for 10 years and we have two beautiful children together. Since having children, we have found ourselves having to set more boundaries with my in-laws because of differences in lifestyles and worldviews. And my mother-in-law takes personal offense whenever my husband attempts to set a boundary for himself or for our family. For example, my three-year-old daughter was having a health issue that we were dealing with, and my husband asked his mother to keep the health updates to herself and not share them with the entire extended family, which she often does with any news. Instead of understanding and respecting his request, she started an argument with him and I started arguing with him and was pushing for a reason for why she shouldn't share this information. She then brought up the fact that we treat her differently than my own mother, quote unquote, who does understand boundaries and is continually respectful of anything we ask, especially when it comes to our children. I know that these outbursts are coming from a place of insecurity and nostalgia for how things were before her children had grown families of their own, but her lack of respect is becoming a persistent problem in causing my husband unnecessary stress. How do you suggest dealing with a parent who is having a difficult time adjusting to the change in family dynamics that naturally come when their children are grown with families of their own? I appreciate the advice that you give. I love your podcast, podcast and I have gotten so many people to listen to it, including my own therapist. Thank you for all that you do. Oh, I love oh, that. Nice. First of all, let's just say this is a shit situation that's incredibly yeah. difficult yeah. to work within. Yeah. You guys are doing absolutely the right thing by setting the boundaries for yourself. It sounds like you're being honest and direct, which is amazing. What we can't do, though, is control how other people react to the boundaries we set. And the hard part is, is you may be treating her differently than your own mother because your own mother it sounds like has um earned your trust when it comes to different things and someone who repeatedly doesn't respect our boundaries is not going to earn that same amount of trust and respect so the question you asked though is how do you suggest dealing with a parent who was having a difficult time adjusting to the change in family dynamics the hard thing that you're going to hear me say today is you're doing it you keep doing exactly what you're doing and they're allowed to get mad and they might, mm -hmm. but it's important that you keep doing exactly what you're doing, which is setting boundaries and thinking of your family first. And the other thing I got to say is you have a pretty wonderful husband because many husbands are not able to set this boundary with their mom. So give him a big smooch right in. <laughs> and <laughs> Because it is, it's really true. If you have a partner that isn't on the same page with you, mm -hmm. it affects everything in your marriage. Mm -hmm. So you and your partner are on the same page and it sounds like you're making decisions for your family. That's all you can do. Yeah. And it must be, you know, just hearing this, it must be hard to watch. I guess your mother-in-law have such a difficult time adjusting to this. Um, it might be the case that like, you are sharing certain things with your own mother. And then with your mother-in-law, maybe your relationship just looks different. Maybe you're not talking about health stuff. Maybe, you know, you're, you're just doing things differently in that relationship then. And that's okay. You know, it's okay that certain relationships take certain places in your life and others take a different place. So I think deciding, you know, if, if she's having a really difficult time keep, keeping health updates to herself, then it might be important to decide how much you are sharing with her, what kinds of things you're sharing with her, knowing that when you are sharing things with her, they might not 
stay, you know, she might not be able to keep the secret. She might not be able to, to hold the privacy. And so you get to decide, okay, well, if she struggles with that, then what is it that we want to share? What is it that we want to do differently? I really feel for this person, right? Like, don't they sound incredible? Yes. Yes. We appreciate you. Thank you for writing this. And we yeah. love when people write Dear Em and Jen's in, when you write questions in. Um, it's just so, it's so helpful for us to be able to answer your questions, support you. And we want to keep doing that. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of Shrink Chicks. We'll see you back here next week for another session. In the meantime, if you want a question answered or a topic discussed, follow us on Instagram at Shrink Chicks. And if you're looking to get connected with a therapist like us to start or continue your therapeutic journey, visit the therapygroup.com. Just fill out a contact form on our website and we will personally match you with one of our amazing therapists. And for all of our therapists and group practice owners out there, we also offer group practice consulting. And if you're looking to support yourself further and support our show, check out our amazing merch options at shrinkchicks.com slash merch and our Know Yourself, Grow Yourself journal on Amazon. Also, if you'd be so kind, we'd love a rating review and for you to share with a friend or an enemy or a mother-in-law, honestly, whoever needs it, so that we can keep reaching more people on our mission to bring mental health topics to your ears every week. Thanks for being here with us. And don't forget to grow yourself. You got to know yourself. Thank you.